Contract administration, again, continuing forward, processing and evaluating bids. And again, we're, this is a maintenance course. We do have contracts when it comes to maintenance. So for instance, uh, the large tonnage uh, equipment that we have in a central plant. So that could be a Johnson Control maintenance agreement. So part of that is I'm going to negotiate a contract, service contract. And part of that service contract is going to have materials involved in that. So I have markups. So very much like a construction contract, I'm going to have a maintenance contract. You know, what hours of operation, how fast are they going to respond to the site in the event of an emergency or a service call? Elevator contracts. Any other type of maintenance contract? What other type of contracts do you think I work with? Landscape. Landscape, absolutely. You've got a landscape contract, custodial housekeeping contract, lighting contract to provide to replace my lights in my parking lots. I don't have a lift. So I get a contract on my light bulb, you know, replacements in my parking lots with those. Um, my enunciation systems, one of my life safety. That's the liability that I want to pass on, right, to a certified supplier, okay, or a contractor. Security, is that part of it also? Security, um, closed circuit TVs, a lot of my intrusion alarms, again, those are outsourced. So I'll bring in, you know, another entity that's certified to work in those systems. Some cases, I will look at li the liability issues, and I say, you know, I can't handle that. I can't handle that with an in-house crew. I can't provide enough training for them on a regular basis, so I'll, I'll outtask that, okay, to another external entity to provide that for me. Self as part of your crews, you have, as far as maintenance-wise, is it, is it pretty general maintenance or is it extensive maintenance? Like pretty uh, extensive maintenance. Um, we went out and we purged the industry and we found technicians that could perform maintenance on the large tonnage equipment. Now, if it gets to the point where they're replacing large motors and components, we don't rebuild them on site. So, but we'll, we'll remove them off the unit, put them on a dolly with a crane, jib crane, and then we'll go ahead and send it out on a flatbed and have those rewounded and brought back into the facility. But I'm saving costs because the markup from a contractor doing that is considerably high. Uh, some cases, if you looked at the percentage, I'm probably about 80, 20, 80% 80 is performed in-house. The other 20%, you know, is out-house to other entities. Okay, good, good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, getting back to negotiating change orders and claims and the changes from within the contract. Okay, again, that's another responsibility within the facility manager, but it all ties into the maintenance component. Okay, what's going to be a considered an acceptable change order? Um, you would consider going from night cleaning to day cleaning, maybe in housekeeping. Okay, that's going to include a couple change orders as well. Because in some cases, the custodians can't get into certain areas of the facility because they're closed. At night, they had full range of the facility, right? So I did that to save energy. But yet on the flip side, I also got to have a better and tighter scheduling with my customers during the daytime so they're not distracted or disturbed. So that's a whole schedule issue. So now you consider that I really saved that much money, you know, in the energy, because now I've got to go through a whole gamut of scheduling with the time. So again, there's pros and cons, okay, that you look look you know look at on a regular basis, okay. Um, again, invoices, inspection oversight, and again, legal and technical specifications, okay, from within the contract documentation. Okay, what's going to be you know, ASHRAE has certain codes and standards. You have local municipality codes and standards such as for fire doors and so on that require maintenance in elevators. So those I also got to look into from a, from a legality standpoint, you know, and I'm meeting the criteria from a code level, okay? One thing I'd hate to have the city of Scottsdale's inspectors that come to my site shut down a certain section of the facility for code violations. That you can't have, okay? Uh, maintenance of building and equipment, again, Preventative maintenance, this, this is going to be the core, okay? And again, keep, keep an eye on this slide, put a little check mark next to it. These are the major parts of maintenance, okay? You're going to have your preventative maintenance, everything that you want to do to extend the service life of that particular piece of equipment. Routine maintenance, day-to-day -day maintenance. These are regular intervals that you're going to have. Routine maintenance would be like changing the batteries on this clock. Okay, I don't think there's a, there's a PM on this clock to change the battery. Somebody's going to say, you know, it's been 5 o'clock for the last two weeks. I think the battery's dead on it. So you'll probably call facilities or someone, and they'll change the battery. But for them to come in on a regular basis at their overhead and labor, they're going to let that clock, basically, the battery runs dead, and they just get the call, and they replace it. Okay, again, 
it's an expensive proposition. The Proximus, though, they'll probably have somebody come in here and check the light bulbs in the Proximus on a daily basis for not being able to conduct a class with students in it. Okay? Major repairs, anything that requires more than one day, a repair that's going to require more than one day to repair, replacing the motor or some coils or some wiring on a piece of equipment, maybe as part of a ductwork or some dampers. Okay, so those are going to be considered the major repairs. I have to shut the system down. I can't do it in place, and I need to schedule a shutdown if it's not emergency maintenance. Emergency repairs are exactly it. I call those unplanned maintenance. Emergency repairs when a piece of equipment goes down that's not, it's not scheduled and it's not planned. I consider that emergency maintenance. What you want to do is minimize that as much as possible. Can you prevent it as much as you want to do? You want to prevent that as much as possible through your preventative maintenance practices. But what, you're, what you, I'm going to measure on at my facility is how many times I had unplanned equipment downtime. That's what I'm measuring. Okay? So if I'm down to 30 minutes a month or one hour a year, that's, that's going to be my baseline for that particular one. Because again, unexpected downtime is affecting operations and individuals. Say I have a building that has 100 engineers and their charge out rate is say $200 an hour and my air handler goes down unexpectedly and say it's out for a week. That means those 200 engineers have got to charge overhead which is directly out of my profit base, out of General Dynamics profit base. So that's unacceptable because again I'm not generating profit. They're not charging out their time because one, I mean obviously part of the business recovery plan to work from home but again, there's still overhead required with that. Okay, so again, emergency repairs is what you don't want. You want to minimize the number of re emergency repairs. Yet on the other hand, you also want to have a plan for that emergency plan, that six inch line that's split. Okay. Alterations and improvements, different types of maintenance requirements. Okay. I'm, up, I'm going to upgrade a piece of equipment. Okay. Um, I always talk about my facility, a portion of it was built in 1957. What was around in 1957? The 1957 Chevy, right? Okay. 1957. I still have air hangers that are running that were built in 1957. Those, those are my pride and joy. Those are my classics. The metal's a lot sturdier, it's a lot thicker. They, they never rust, right? Okay. But the motors have been replaced with higher energy, there have been, you know, drives, you know, variable speed frequency drives installed in these particular air handlers. Coils have been replaced with more. But the cabinet itself, the infrastructure, it's still there. So that's going to be considered an alteration. And not only that, it's impossible to get the air handler out because they built the building around it, okay? Thoughts back in 1957? I mean, my facility is one of the first air-conditioned buildings in Scottsdale. People went to work at Motorola at that time because it was air conditioning. They had a VAP cooler in Arizona. Does any, has anybody ever gone to a VAP cooled home? Yeah, sure. Right? It's like, wow, it's either sticky or it's not, right? So imagine working in an air conditioned manufacturing facility. I don't want to go home. Can I work extra for free? Because I love the temperature, right? Okay. So again, so alterations and improvements would be considered in that. And of course, housekeeping, another maintenance entity. Carpeting, regular extraction, so I don't have to replace my carpeting every two years. I want to maximize the life of this particular carpet tile as long as I possibly can. Facility managers were cheap by nature. Our DNA is cheap. If I could extend that door, this paint, whatever, for 50 years, I'm all in, right? Because again, I hate having to buy things and spend things, okay? Right? And again, the O&M, the operations and maintenance, uh, responsibilities is planning, estimating. Um, there's two items down here at the bottom, okay, monitor workload. Non-reoccurring and reoccurring, okay. What do you think the non-reoccurring? Do you think that would be somewhat uh, emergency maintenance or emergency breakdown? I don't want it to reoccur again. So what I'm looking at, any type any, any type of action in regards to my, to my maintenance plan, I don't want it to be reoccurring. Okay? So reoccurring maintenance, though, is going to be routine maintenance. It's going to be scheduled. I know the intervals. 
So I can set my clock on this. So I know exactly I need 40 hours once a month to perform all these maintenance duties and activities. So anytime that a non-reoccurring maintenance comes up, that's going to what? Create schedule changes because that's emergency maintenance. Or I may need to contract that out to an external entity, which now what impacts my budget. Okay. So those were the two that I wanted to point out in this particular slide. We only got a few more. Okay. Predictive maintenance is another aspect. And again, we'll go into these more specifically next week when we go into the uh, preventative and predictive maintenance um, portion of the book. But these are some typical predictive maintenance. Is the typical is a type of planned maintenance that utilizes technology which allows the forecasting of failures through monitoring and analysis of the condition of the equipment. So I call this my forensic maintenance. Okay. I call this my CSI. Okay. Everybody's familiar with, right, with the crime labs and so on. You look at every, you know, but they can find an individual, the bad person with a piece of DNA. So predictive maintenance, I consider that exactly that, forensic maintenance. So what I'm trying to do is use technology to predict the failure in a piece of equipment. So part of those would be vibration monitoring, infrared, okay, oil analysis, ultrasonics, finding air leaks in compressed air lines. You can use, also use ultrasonics to find leaks in valves. Believe it or not, packings in valves. You can use ultrasonic technology. Infrared, you can find leaks in roofs using infrared technology. You can also find building envelopes that have been breached just looking at the different variations of temperature. So all these are technologies that are available. So part of the maintenance plan, you want to what? Minimize. One, you want to minimize the unexpected interruptions as much as possible. But I'm going to apply technology to it. How cool would it be to look at a building, say you got a six-story building, you go in and you shoot an infrared, say it's middle of July, right? You shoot an infrared at it, you know, like 11 o'clock at night and you find all the cold spots on that envelope on all four sides of the building. You know, now you know exactly where you got your air leakage and you go up there during the day and you find out that maybe the gasket material has you know, been compromised or maybe there's a cracked window. Maybe someone left a window open all night long. Okay, so again, you use this technology to predict and find these opportunities. And again, it equates to what? Cost savings, better performance, right? Okay. Other items is motor analysis, megas. Okay. Finding out what resistance is within that motor. When it takes time to replace that motor, you schedule it, you replace it, put a replacement on it, and you send the old one out. Right? You have it re rewound, and you bring it back, and you put it in your stores. Okay. Other items would be laser shaft alignment technology, belts and so on, pulleys and shibs. And then, of course, the tong test would be in medium to high voltage electrical testing in regards to breakers and racking out breakers. Okay, for anything from 4160 on up to 5 kBA, 15 kBA. Okay. Yes, Jack. Um, don't they test uh, by using infrared on breakers and electrical? Yeah. They can tell the temperature, absolutely. and then they know when it's going to break based on how hot Oh, it absolutely. Is. So, you know, with the contraction and expansion of voltage, you know, um, you'll see what you consider is you know, connections that are either fatigued, okay, where they've got to go down and shut them down and then loose, re. Loose Loose wires would be another one. Insulation is, thank you for bringing that out, insulation is starting to break down, okay? Because again, power, what, is it constant? It's always what, cycling. It spikes maybe in the middle of the afternoon, comes way down in the middle of the night, okay? But again, every one of these items, believe it or not, it's like, how much maintenance do you do? It's like the maintenance folks never go to sleep. Because again, it's one of the biggest, you know, criteria is zero downtime, okay? So let me go on here, okay? Unplanned or reactive maintenance, okay. okay, is unscheduled maintenance, refers to any maintenance work that it was not on an approved maintenance schedule before it began, okay. So the typical types is corrective, corrects unanticipated uh, component failure. So if, say for instance, I'm performing maintenance on an air handler, air conditioning unit, and I notice that some of the connections are loose. So part of my corrective maintenance um, since I'm there, I'm going to go ahead and tighten up the wire nuts. I'm going to replace that section of, in, of insulation. Okay. Uh, run to fail, we talked about the clock. Some other items are restroom fans. I don't have any maintenance plans for restroom fans. They just run to fail. So what do you think the first clue is that the restroom fan went out? 
yeah, the smell, right? You get the calls from the restrooms. So folks say, hey, is there something wrong with this restroom? Sure enough, you know, the re I, don't, I don't put that on my, on my building automation system that the fan went out. The, the trap that lost the seal. Yeah, the trap that lost the seal, okay. So those, so those are considered run to fail. And then, of course, emergency maintenance is required to avert impending dangers such as broken, fixed, and exterior windows. So you want to minimize any type of hazards to the employees or the occupants of the building. Okay, so those are going to be considered emergency maintenance. I can't stop. I've got to do it now. Okay, no speaking the way. Remember those. Okay, those are going to be important. Different types of maintenance. Now, reliability-centered maintenance is where you converge. You take your predictive maintenance, okay, um, activities and, of course, uh, applications, and you tie them into your preventative maintenance. So reliability-based maintenance, you're tying the best of the best into one particular maintenance component. So it determines what, what mixture of preventative maintenance, predictive maintenance, and proactive repairs or run to failure approaches. So the first one would be failure modes and effect analysis. Helps determine the failure probabilities and systems reliability calculations. So in particular, here in Phoenix, in the valley, uh, condenser units up on the roof. Okay. I've got a three-motor condenser evaporative unit up on the roof. That's three motors on it, right? So I can predict when those particular motors, typically it's no more than five years. After five years, they fail. Now, in your home, you can say, but my house air conditioner has been running for 10 years with no problems. But on your home, you cycle those. In an industrial facility, they run 724. So I got a three circuit, right, unit. What happens when I lose one motor? What happens to the two remaining circuits? Right? So now that they spike. So my amperage in those motors, what? So I'm the maintenance manager. I'm saying, yeah, but I got two more. Don't worry about it. So six months go by. What happens to those two remaining motors? But I just exceeded what the curve of reliable life in those particular motors because what is the extra wear and tear on them, right? So then the second one goes out. Well, maybe I better do something now, right? Okay, so let's go up and replace the one that failed six months ago, and let's look at the one that just failed, and then we'll leave the third one alone. What do you think? Probably replace all three at the same time. So you start fresh. And you put that in your CMMS, right? So you document that, that all three of them will relate. It's like replacing one tire on your car at a time. Don't want to do that, right? Because you're always rotating tires, right? So do it all at the one time, OK? Root cause analysis applies to Y factor. OK, uh, reach beyond the symptoms and find out the root causes. So what was the cause of this particular unit to go out the motor? So in some cases, you may say send that particular component to a lab. Have them break it down and give you a report back. The windings were weak. You know, the pipe was fatigued. Yes? Don't you guys, uh, as facility management, don't you struggle with that all the time as far as if you can replace all of them or not at once because you have budget? But because I know the facility manager I know is always complaining about, I'd love to fix it, but I don't know when it fixes it. Well, you know, so you guys are constantly doing it. It's a balance, you know, and you really prioritize your facility. High priority, zero downtime versus low priority, acceptable downtime. So, you know, you look at the infrastructures that support those particular, like an operating room in a hospital. I mean, if I was on the operating table and the lights went out, it's like, oh boy, right? So operating room in a hospital, I mean, there is no, no second guessing in that particular one. That's 100% predictive maintenance, zero downtime. But you bring up a great point. You're always balancing on what can you do and what, because every one of it costs dollars, and there's so many dollars that you can spread around. Okay, so excellent point. We're always balancing to answer your question. Always balancing, but really priorities is how you're going to balance those. Okay, what are we considered acceptable or not? Um, age exploration uses historical data to better understand failures and improve reliability. Again, I go back to the routine, non-routine maintenance. If I have a component section of the building like light bulbs, oh, light bulbs, I love light bulbs, right? I have light bulbs that have been burning for five years. I get one that burns out, two that burns out, three that burn out. And I'm always going in there replacing light bulbs versus doing a complete relamp. So at some point in time, you draw that line in the sand saying, you know, if I got 1,000 light bulbs, when I lose 10%, it's time to do a relamp. And you identify that in your plan, your facility's master plan, on where you're going to budget. That's my rule of thumb. Or when I have a renovation. Okay. 
So say, for instance, you have a renovation, you go back, you look at the light bulb burnout okay, rate. Say, so, you know, I've noticed that, you know, you've got 15% of light bulbs and I'm renovating this entire 30,000 square foot area. Do you want me to go ahead and just do a relamp for you? And include that in your overall project costs. Is, is that 10% within a given time period? Like a month? A week? Typically, that's going to be within 12 months. Within 12 months? Yeah, okay, within 12 months. So what you do now is you record these rates. Right. Same thing on, um, uh, I'm going to go back to water heaters. I don't know how many water heaters I have at my facility, but if they were all installed about the same time and one fails, chances are what? The rest of them are going to start going right after that. Okay. So that's where you kind of look at the age. But that's why it's, so it's so important though when you finish your project, all the documentation, all the specifications and equipment that you installed, all the OEM information, you turn that over to the facilities management department because they insert that into their computerized maintenance management system. Then the clock starts ticking at that point. And again, just I got a little graph up here. Um, there's a point where you have too much maintenance. I mean, there's one thing about not having enough maintenance, but you get to the point where you got too much maintenance. You're wearing the bolts off the piece of equipment because you've taken them off so many times. So if you look at here, you've got a low impact where you have no maintenance, you have a higher level of repair costs. And that goes in hand, right? I have no maintenance program, so my piece of equipment, every one of them is going to run to fail. This is going to also affect what the un un unexpected downtime, lost productivity within your facility. So that's at this spectrum. If I go to this spectrum, I'm maintaining this piece of equipment every hour. Well, that's excessive. There's labor involved in that. But also, look at the downtime. It also went up too, didn't it? Because I'm also affecting the customer. Oops, you know what? It's time for my PM. Again, you were just here yesterday. So what you want to do is they considered the bathtub, which is this portion right in here. So that's where you're going to identify your optimum maintenance schedule. Okay? And your optimum maintenance schedule is going to be based by feedback. Uh, you, just, you just mentioned it now by how many calls that you get in. How many times did this piece of equipment fail? So what you want to do is cut that sweet spot at the bottom of that bathtub. You're providing just enough maintenance, but not too much maintenance. And you're minimizing the downtime where that's going to be acceptable to the organization. Okay. And then alterations and improvements. Again, alterations required to perform okay, facility equipment or systems to perform a different function. So we may alter, and this happens at my facility. In a rate. I have an area that was originally built for an office area. But then I converted it to a lab, which requires humidification. My air handle was never designed for humidification. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to modify it. So once I modify it, did I alter the original intent of that piece of equipment? Sure I did. Okay. Um, my, my stepdad used to tell me when I was growing up, you know, hot rodding, right? You modify a car. So what's the first thing you want to do with a car as a teenager? You want to make it go faster, right? You used to warn me, you touch one thing on your car, you're going to have to go through the entire car. And sure enough, did I ever listen? Of course not. I was 18 and I knew it all, right? Okay. No, so you modify one piece of equipment where you alter it for its, in, for it's not its intended use was. Now what you've done, you started a whole chain reaction on that. So in some cases, that alteration, you might take that entire unit out and replace it with one that's going to be suitable for that. That gets to the cost factor. Is it worth the money to do this? Well, the question is, how long is that lab going to be in there? Oh, only for two years. Well, maybe we'll provide a temporary or a backup system for those two years. And then once it, it goes away, we go back to the original office. But first of all, you don't want to put a lab in the office area in the first place. So that gets back to those spaces that we talked about originally, right? OK. And of course, improvements is work required to increase the functional productive performance levels of equipment and systems, uh, equipment and systems. So always, always want to optimize the performance level. If it's electrical, if it's HVAC systems, if it's plumbing infrastructures, always want to, I want to optimize the performance levels as long as possible. Okay. So again, a lot of variables to look at, but all, all as, uh, as, as, uh, as equally important. Okay. <coughs> Housekeeping, just one item to keep in mind, janitorial landscaping grounds and operating service typically part of the housekeeping component. Again, we'll cover that separately as a chapter later. And again, facilities management. In short, 
process of coordinating efforts expended to provide complete operations and maintenance service support so the physical facility may operate at optimum and lowest overall total cost. So everybody can do that, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. Optimize use at the lowest cost, okay? And again, the prerequisites. There's some items on here, like maybe being a psychologist <laughs> that are not included in here, but uh, schedule or ability to apply techniques. Okay, infrastructure systems techniques, problem solver, conflict resolution, we covered those earlier in the class. Okay. Motivation and influence. Part of facility managers, uh, I would say portfolio, list of things to do. Motivate people to do things what they don't want to do. Okay. Motivate contractors to perform to a certain level. Part of the value-based okay, concept and theory. And again, philosophy and policies. Drive consistency. In a maintenance plan, consistency is everything. Do it the same way every time. Don't alter it, don't change it. It's got to be done that way every time. Once you start altering, then you start to slide that to, okay, to the uh, right. Again, that's what you don't want to happen. Okay. And of course, providing guidelines. Organizational structure that goes in hand. You're going to have reporting levels within an, within an o and organization. Supervisors, management, technicians, specialists, and so on. Okay, so all those going to go hand in hand. Okay. And analyzing the needs. Really, it's converting the results into the needs of the customers. Okay. My customers at General Dynamics, they perform a product, which is research. Part of the research is all computer code. So what I want to do is make sure that the data center is up and running, because they have to use computer as their primary tool. So part of my entire maintenance plan at my facility is ensuring that they have reliable power for one, and there's no un unplanned interruptions okay, to their particular workstations. Okay, that's where we make our profit, is how much charge outs that we have. Okay. Goals and objectives, again, goes with anything else. You've got to measure with what you're doing, okay, like anything else that you do. On new construction, you're going to be measured. What's, what's the measurements you have in construction? What are you going to be measured on? Time, schedule, good. Budget, costs, scope, and quality. Those are all going to be measurements. So when it comes to a maintenance plan, same item. Unexpected downtime, unexpected interruptions, cost, optimization of performance and pieces of equipment. Okay. 